What's up, Josh? Um, here's Radical Lesson 2, a little explanation of the notes I'll send you. Um, I have us starting the night off with a discussion on discipline and seriousness. I think uh, me and Christy were both disappointed in our group's level of uh, just seriousness and paying attention. Audrey also expressed that, um, and she was pretty upset about how your group handled that. I don't know if you share that sentiment, but uh, I don't put that on you or on me as the teacher necessarily, especially the first week. Um, it's just how the students reacted, but I do want us to, to react back to that and uh, set a tone that's more serious. This is supposed to be our best discipleship event, and it's also, obviously, you know, a serious book and a serious topic, and we want to have some kind of reverence for that. And so, uh, I've been brainstorming with Audrey, and if you have thoughts, send those to me about how exactly to go about doing that and what maybe that first step should be. But it's definitely something we need to address, uh, I think. And then I just covered chapter three in this lesson. I know you said chapter seven was your floating lesson, and you thought maybe it would fit in here. Um, I think it will fit in better to another chapter. So uh, I'm not sure exactly how we're going to move chapter seven in, but I think this chapter was, I had enough to make it stand alone. Um, and I have two questions that the night will center around that I think I really like the outline. I think it will help us uh, be able to keep the lesson in your head and make sense to you and be helpful for students. And so the main questions are, what is the goal of your life and how are you going to get there? What is the goal of your life and how are you going to get there? And so we talked a little bit last week about the American dream. I don't know if you guys did or not, uh, but we'll redefine that. Uh, make sure students remember what that is. A lot of our younger students don't hear that term that much anymore, even though it's still uh, a prevalent mindset in the culture. Um, so we'll define it. I may give them the definition that Platt gives. I have that quoted for you here. Um, and then we're going to ask, what is the goal of the American dream? And how are you supposed to get there? What are the means of the American dream? So we're answering those two main questions according to the American dream mindset. The goal is obviously to make much of yourself, to live a happy, comfortable life, to not be poor, rise out of poverty, at least to middle class. Um, the means of doing that are your own talent, your own abilities, your own resolve, your own work ethic. You're going to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and make this happen. And anybody can do that if they try hard enough. Um, and then we're going to evaluate those one by one and compare them to the gospel. So we'll start with the means, how we're going to get there, or at least how the American dream says we should get to our goal in life. And that is, like we just said, our own work ethic and our own abilities. Just ask students what they think about that. Is that a good mindset to have? It is a bad mindset to have. Is it, um, does it have some good and some bad? Is it true all the time, never, sometimes? Uh, what are their thoughts? Uh, so let them think for a while. Uh, there are some good things about it, but there are certainly some negatives, um, and you want to make sure that you get those pointed out. So if they don't actually bring up the negatives, these problems that I've listed, uh, you may even reiterate the question and say, what are some potential problems from this mindset and see if they can come up with it. Um, the first one is that uh, just a basic principle that not everyone starts in the same spot. They don't all have the same situation. Some people start being rich already. Some people start dirt poor with one parent in the house or no parents. Um, and also, honestly, not everyone has the same talent and the same ability. So even if you work super hard, uh, not everyone has equal talent and ability to rise up to the same place. And that's, um, I think, a true problem of the American dream. But where we actually later on want to connect that to the gospel is that if we're being fueled by God's power, um, it doesn't matter that you didn't start in the same place. It doesn't matter that you don't have as much talent or as much charisma or as much outward ability as someone else. Through God's Spirit, you can be just as effective and even more effective than people that are uh, more talented or may have gotten a better deck of cards than you. Uh, don't say that yet, but eventually that's how that actually connects in. Uh, the second one is more obvious uh, that this mindset is pretty contradictory to the gospel. Um, and so then you're going to ask them to read um, John 15:5 is about Jesus being the vine and we need to abide in him. And then at the end he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. 
Uh, and Psalm 127.1 is a sweet verse about uh, if, the, if the Lord doesn't build the house, then the builder labors in vain. If the watchman, or if God doesn't watch the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It's the same idea that if the Lord is not in it, if he's not supplying the power, uh, then it's vanity. You're, you're wasting your time. You're not being truly effective. Um, and so you want to merge these principles here a little bit. Uh, we don't want to demean the idea that Christians should still work hard. We don't want to demean the idea that Christians shouldn't use the gifts and the talents that God has given them. But we don't want to only rely on that. In fact, we should primarily be relying on God's strength and not our own. And so the means that we should have as Christians, in contrast to the American dream, is that we should uh, pursue, um, we should uh, be fueled by God's power rather than our own abilities. Um, now I have a brief discussion um, about uh, Platt. I think one of the coolest things he says in the chapter, or uh, cool is maybe a wrong word, convicting, uh, he says it doesn't take uh, the power of God to draw a crowd. And so see if students can reflect on this based on our church culture. We touched on this a little bit last week about how Jesus was not super into drawing the crowds. He actually said stuff that almost intentionally sent people away. Um, so ask people what they think about this statement, um, and then you can kind of evaluate it. So obviously, Platt's right. It doesn't take any power from God to draw a crowd, uh, and you can demonstrate that by the fact that people that aren't looking to God's power at all or even acting like they are can draw a crowd. Football games, sports games, concerts, they all can get a huge crowd, and that doesn't take any of, of God's power and God's spirit to, to do that. Uh, but sadly, that's how we usually uh, measure our church success. Uh, we think that uh, a church is blessed if they are growing rapidly, if they have a ton of people in their building. If the room is full, then God must be working in that place, and that place must be blessed by God. And that's not necessarily true because it doesn't take God's power, God's ability in our culture to draw a crowd of people. Uh, we can do that with... Great speakers, fancy speakers, um, entertaining worship music. We can do that with really fancy buildings. Um, we can do all these things apart from God's power. And um, that's maybe not the best church strategy. We might want to be leaning on God's power a little bit more. And so then you'll ask the question about if we can do all of these things in church without God's power, what are things that we actually can't do, that there is no way you can do this without the power of God? Um, and that is, uh, you can't change people's lives, truly change their hearts without God's power. You can't move people into the commitment that we're really asking students to give um, without God's power. Uh, you can't give, move people into committing their life to missions and to reaching the unreached. We can't move people to let go of the American dream and sell all of their possessions to give to the dying world. We can't uh, call people to work past where they could retire um, and to work for God's kingdom. We can't get rid of habitual sins in our life without God's power. Um, and these are the things that actually should be our goals as Christians. Our goal shouldn't be to have a big crowd, a big building, um, to draw in a lot of people, just like that wasn't Jesus' goal. Our goal should be to, to make disciples, to make true, real, genuine followers of Christ. Um, and unfortunately, we just see this pattern a lot in churches, and particularly, particularly in student ministry, Big student ministries, sweet band, really funny student pastor, no disciples, no serious commitments from students. And so then they go on once they leave the ministry and they uh, leave church altogether uh, or they uh, just casually attend church like the rest of America does for the rest of their lives. And that's, um, while it may have looked good while it's happening, that's uh, not the goal of Christianity. That's not the goal of student ministry. That's not what we're trying to achieve. It actually does nothing, zero, in the kingdom of God. And so um, you can kind of transition with a question that I wouldn't ask students to answer out loud, but reflect on it, and I'll reflect on it. You can reflect on it as well. I think it's a good question to ask is, when was the last time you did something in your life that you really needed God's power in order to do it? Like, you went into a situation and you're like, I cannot do this by myself. I need God's Spirit to be here with me. Um, 
naturally we don't push ourselves to do those things. We like to uh, stay in our comfort zone, stay in places where uh, our strength and our power is enough to get the job done. Um, I think there, okay, never mind. Then you'll kind of transition. I didn't really make that clear here, uh, but you'll want to transition and read John 14, 12. Um, which talks about Jesus has just given them the promise of the Holy Spirit. And um, he says, uh, you can do greater things than I did uh, through the Spirit, which is one of the craziest verses in the Bible. It's weird. I always read it twice when I see it, and it just really challenges me. How is that possible that we can do greater things than Jesus? Obviously, that doesn't mean that we can uh, redeem the world and pay the price of sin, uh, but we can... Uh, do miracles greater than Christ did. We can see more people come to truly know uh, the Lord um, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so you'll ask that, what could we do if we were fueled by the Holy Spirit uh, in our ministry and in our lives? Um, and just give the obvious answer from the text. Hopefully students can interpret that. Um, and then demonstrate that that's what we see in the early church. That's what we see in the book of Acts. And that's actually exactly who Jesus is talking to in uh, John 14, 12. He's talking to the disciples who are regular guys, uneducated, common fishermen, tax collector people um, that then go on to shake the entire world through the, the power of the Holy Spirit. And we, uh, the, Luke is extremely intentional in the fact that he points to that in the book of Acts over and over and over. I only have two references to it because just for the sake of time, but there's tons of references to filled by the Spirit. In the power of the Holy Spirit, they did this. In the power of the Holy Spirit, they did that. The Lord added to their number. You see that uh, it's in the uh, the section Platt writes. Um, you can use whatever examples you want, but that's what we see in the early church is a people that relied on the Spirit of God, and they did things that were even greater. They saw greater crowds. They saw more people come to be disciples than Christ did while he was on earth. Uh, they did incredible things through the power of the Spirit. Um, and then we'll shift into that second question, what is the goal of your life? And again, we're going to say, uh, how does the American dream answer that question? And how does the Bible answer that question? Uh, the goal of the American dream is, like we said at the beginning, to make much of yourself, to make you look good, to make yourself comfortable, to make yourself have a happy, enjoyable life. Um, and then you'll flip that and ask, what is the goal of the Christian life? Um, let them take a stab at that. Let them dwell and think on that. What really am I trying to do as a follower of Christ? What is the goal and purpose of my life? Um, you can say it a lot of different ways. Succinctly, you could say uh, the goal of our lives is to make much of God, to glorify God. Um, we do that by growing in our relationship with Him, knowing God better, and we also do that by making Him known to other people. Uh, that's the, the chief purpose of the life of a Christian, or that should be our chief purpose. And I think that's demonstrated well uh, by John the Baptist in John 3.30, one of my favorite verses. Uh, his disciples or, or some people come to him and they're like, man, you used to have this huge crowd that was following you and now all those people are leaving to go follow Jesus. How do you feel about that? And he says, he must increase and I must decrease. That is, that's the goal of Christianity. Increase God's glory and um, decrease our own. Uh, an emphasis on making much of God. Um, and then you'll flip to this last little section that I want to be really personal, really impactful. Um, again, a question, a rhetorical question that I wouldn't ask them to answer. Um, what is actually the goal of your life? So we've seen what the American dream, the goal of that is. We've seen what the goal of Christianity is. Now, what actually is the goal of your life? Um, let them sit, talk through that maybe a little bit, but let them sit and reflect on that. I think students may need a moment to actually really think about that. What am I trying to do with my life? And that's a good question for them to dwell on. Uh, what is the goal of my life? A lot of us just hold it subconsciously in the back of our heads. Um, and if that's how we hold the goal of our life, most of us will default to some version of the American dream. 
maybe a Christianized version of it, but it'll be similar to the American dream. I want to go to school. I want to go to college. I want to get a good job. I want to find a spouse. I want to take lots of vacations and see the world. I want to retire as early as I can so I can stop working. And then for the rest of my life, I want to enjoy the spoils of this world. Um, that is the subconscious goal of many of us. It's the water that we swim in in America. It's what we're surrounded by. And the call of the gospel is to let go of that and to embrace the goal of Christianity, to embrace Christ. Um, and it's impossible for us to do that without Christ working in us. Um, and then close your time. You don't have to. I'm planning to close my time this way uh, with this brief, it's a seven minute clip of John Piper, one of his most famous sermons, uh, usually called the Don't Waste Your Life Sermon. I would watch this in preparation yourself if you haven't seen it before. Um, it was, it's from 2000, so uh, the very beginning of my life and your life. Uh, it was a really impactful sermon that really affected a lot of the church leaders that currently are leading the church. So like people like David Platt and J.D. Greer and these famous pastors, a lot of them were in the crowd on that day, heard Piper said what he said, and were changed forever by it. And I think what he does in these seven minutes is explain what we're trying to do in this lesson and in this book and in this series in better words than I could ever do it. Uh, better words than I've heard anyone else ever do it. And so I plan to show this. I plan to give some disclaimers before I turn it on and tell them, hey, um, this is a video from 2000. The graphics are terrible. People are dressed kind of weird from 22 years ago. John Piper is uh, he's a strange guy. He has some strange mannerisms. I think it's funny, um, and I think it adds to how much I like him. But there are some things in this video that you can just make fun of and that students could just be like, that's silly, let me laugh at that, and call and challenge them to just listen for seven minutes to actually look into the heart of what he's saying, to look at the passion that he says it with, uh, and to be focused on the message and not be focused on all those other things that can be distractions. So give them those disclaimers. Turn on that video, and then I would briefly close after that and just share your heart. I'm planning to just share my heart there so I don't have that written out of, man, that's, I don't want that for my life. I don't want my life to be wasted. I don't want you guys to waste your lives. I so passionately want our students to push off the American dream and pursue the goal of Christianity, to pursue a life of knowing Christ and making him known to other people. So... Let me know if you have any questions, if anything uh, doesn't make sense to you, uh, if that link doesn't work, or if you can't find that video. Uh, thanks for all you do, Josh. Uh, really looking forward to how God uses you this semester.